you know, there's a there's, that's a two sided coin lack of atmosphere. Like, for example, at the Trappist one system where we're not really sure what red dwarfs do to their planets and, you know, how they flare and what are the, the intricacies of it. But then we look there and we detect no atmosphere on the very closest in worlds. Yeah, that that story is unfolding now and it's and the the outcome seems bad that I think we're getting the sad ending to this story. You know, all after NASA's Kepler spacecraft lost its reaction wheels and they had to shift the mission, they were able to observe these M dwarfs, these red dwarf stars, and they were able to find planets around these stars, Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone. And of course, famously, we know of the TRAPPIST-1 system. And so this is the hope, right? That that maybe we weren't able to find the Earth-like worlds orbiting around sun-like stars, but maybe we're going to find these Earth-like worlds around red dwarf stars. They're, they have a habitable zone, but these stars are also awful. They have flares that are much more powerful than a star of that you would expect of that size. The planets, because the star is giving off less radiation, the planets are huddled up close, and so they're just taking enormous solar flares, broadsides, just one after the other. And the worry is that these planets, even though they might be in the habitable zone, they are just too scorched by their star to be habitable. And we saw, you know, with, thanks to Webb, we got analysis of the first two planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system, B and C. And the hope was that maybe these are going to be super Venuses. And nope, they're airless, so they're super Mercuries. And then maybe the hope is TRAPPIST-1D, which is the first planet that's going to be, you know, in the habitable zone. TRAPPIST-1D, E, and F. Those three worlds are in the habitable zone around this star. And we haven't seen the official results. But, like, I talked to a researcher in a recent interview, and he's not particularly enthusiastic about the results. And he sort of feels like... Like the writing is on the wall now that that red dwarf stars kill their planets. And so we might have to throw out that entire class of planets as being just too awful and move on to the to the larger stars with less, you know, where the planets are farther away in the habitable zone and the and the stars produce less deadly flares. There's still hope, though, and unfortunately, this is a this is a far hope because we can't detect this. But that some of those those planets in a in a you know red dwarf systems might have ice shell moons and may host a sort of that secondary habitability that's protected from the radiation of the star. But the thing is, is you can't detect it. It's you know it's locked under ice. Right. I mean, once you've got things under ice, one then you're protected from the radiation. You don't you don't have to worry about the atmosphere. But then it like. I don't think we, like, yes, there could be life on Enceladus or Europa, but that's not what we're imagining when we're thinking about a, a world filled with life. We're imagining some forest moon, right, of Endor, not a ocean with space whales under 100 kilometers of ice. Now, there is hope, though, because if the red dwarfs are problematic and unlikely to host surface exoplanet life, Earth-like life, you still have another entire class. In addition to type G, you also have type K, the orange dwarfs. And my understanding is that these are really difficult to study exoplanets and characterize their atmospheres around the orange dwarfs because of glare. Have you heard anything about that? Right. So so this is the great challenge. And it's not just the the, the K dwarfs, it's the it's the G dwarfs, it's the stars like our sun that that the brightness of the star is so overwhelming compared to the brightness of the planet. It's a factor of 10 billion. So, so in other words, you've got to be able to dim the star by a factor of 10 billion to get at the light from the planet. If there was no star, and yet the star was illuminating the planet somehow, then we could see it with the kinds of telescopes that are available today. James Webb could see this but the star is overwhelming. And so James Webb is equipped with a coronagraph that is able to dim the light of the star, and it's pretty good. Um, the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which is the next big space telescope that NASA is working on, is got 
you know, its main job is to characterize dark, dark matter, dark energy to map out the cosmos, but it also has a next generation coronagraph on board that theoretically should be able to dim the light of the star by a factor of 100 million. And that should be enough to dim the light from a star to be able to reveal Jupiter type worlds orbiting around a sun like star. And so if this works, this technology, and it's, it's a, it's a fascinating, you know, a lot of people aren't aware of this. And you sort of sacrifice the entire telescope field of view to zoom in on this tiny little region of space and run it through this coronagraph to get this difference of, of light. But Nancy Grace Roman should be turning up exo Jupiters. And if that works, if this technology is shown to be effective, then the plan is to then scale this to the next level with the Habitable Worlds Observatory. And that's going to be what was, you know, we had Louvoir and Habex, and there was all these big mega telescopes that were going to be coming after James Webb. And now they've been collapsed down into this Habitable Worlds Observatory. So if Nancy Grace Roman's coronagraph does its job, then we should get a chance to see the next iteration of that coronagraph, and then we will finally be observing Earth-sized worlds orbiting around K-dwarves and sun-like stars. Very weird history, the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, <laughs> yeah. in that it started out, at least its mirrors started out intended for a spy satellite. But yeah. What's the history of that, and what's the timeline on on getting that up and running? I mean, that's always such a bizarre story. So. I guess, you know, the US people always say like, oh, why don't they point the Hubble Space Telescope at the ground? Like they could use it as a spy satellite. And you're like, well, let me tell you a story, <laughs> which is that back in the early 2000s, the military contacted NASA and said, we've got these two Hubble class telescopes that we don't need that aren't good enough anymore for the kind of ground of Earth observation that we do, the kind of spying that we like to do, that these two Hubbles, two, were not good enough. And so they said, do you want them? And NASA was like, of course. And so they 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 built one into one telescope. I forget which one is, IPXC? Anyway, they built one into a telescope, and then the second one is the Nancy Grace Roman. And so they changed the optics on it so that it's got this really big, wide field of view. And it's due to launch 2027? Yeah, 2027. And so the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope is due for launch in 2027. And, you know, it's the next big space telescope that I'm quite excited about. And I think people aren't really aware of what it's going to be capable of. It will find hundreds of thousands of exoplanets, probably tens of thousands for sure, using gravitational microlensing. It will also be able to identify these exoplanets directly imaging. And so using that coronagraph that I mentioned, not to mention characterizing dark matter, dark energy, helping map the cosmos at a scale that's never been done before. So it is it is a really exciting telescope. Now it's a visible light telescope, right? It's not infrared. Or, is it's it infrared. infrared? It's infrared. It. Yeah. Yeah. But not infrared in the, in the same... Yeah, it's near infrared. So it's not in the same class as. Well, that's as interesting. That actually makes James sense Webb, for spy satellite. Is, 